Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Business ethics is what we're focusing on today. That has been the mainstay of his life for many, many years as a adjunct professor, a researcher, definitely on his radar and still is to the day. We're going to take that information, ethics connected to business, and talk about higher education and so much more today with Ronald Birnbaum, who joins us on the program. Welcome back. Hi, Steve. Good to be with you. Good to have you back here and love your viewpoints every time we get together and how you look at even our lives, common events, things that we deal with, how it connects to ethics. So today, higher education, but we're going to go deeper than that. What are we focusing on today? Well, let me just put this in perspective. We've talked so far about various uh, current developments, and I've tried to link them to uh, larger eth ethical issues within a standard uh, analytic frame. We've done things like uh, Boeing aircraft, uh, uh, computers and their impact on uh, on young children. And uh, last week, uh, last week, what did we do? We did last week, uh, we talked about... Uh, uh, housing and, and so on. So we've got three meetings left and I'm going to concentrate today on the, um, the whole issue of college education and the widening in income gap. The latter has been much in the news. Both of them have been because it's graduation time and Mm. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, focus on uh, those academics who have been those uh, college presidents who have been fired or whatever, and the uh, various graduation speeches and so on. But there is a connection, and uh, I think it's uh, been somewhat overlooked. Uh, and so we will I would like to talk about that today. Absolutely. So, when you talk about college education, what is in quotation marks, college, uh, you're, you're really talking about three different things. You're talking about selective universities and colleges, the, 20, the, the 25 to 50 uh, colleges and universities that are, you know, really in the, in the top tier and uh, most of them have been there probably for at least uh, 50 years. And uh, so that's one group. They're four years. They're liberal arts. And uh, so uh, you can't get a liberal arts degree by taking an accounting course online. And, uh, you know, there's a certain thing involved. Uh, so let's talk about uh, liberal arts, first of all. Uh, typically, the first two years will involve what they call distribution requirements, a foreign language, a science, literature or English, and uh, various, uh, you know, political science, history, uh, philosophy. And if you want to graduate with honors, you usually have to write an, a page a paper with original research. And uh, so that's that's number one, and uh, that's one group, and that's where the gap is uh, is wide uh, between those people and the rest in terms of their uh, participation in in so uh, society at large, uh, typically. Now, uh, then there are functional training type things. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, skills and so on and so forth. And as, as uh, many people on uh, various television programs and so on have said, more students, sh more, more young people should do this uh, and not worry about uh, these colleges and universities, and there'd be good reason to do that if it were a, you know, but you give up 
a considerable amount. One thing you give up is about a hundred thousand dollars a year uh, in debt, a total of four hundred thousand uh, dollars typically for the degree. Some of which maybe you're able to handle on your own, but most most people wind up saddled with debt uh, for much uh, of the rest of their lives. Um, and this is in stark contrast to people of my generation uh, who uh, whose entire education probably cost what the first semester does now. And so the uh, people have been urged to consider alternatives so they're not saddled with debt uh, for the you know for the rest of their lives. And that makes sense at one level, but at the other level, when you talk about the income disparities, you talk about the top 10% and the other 90%, the huge wage disparities. And even within that top 10%, there is a top 1%, which has a significant gap between the other 9%. So uh, that's something to consider. And uh, as you go, as you go forward, uh, you know, you go out, you get a job. Now, for example, uh, the chief executive officer today typically makes about 278 times the amount of money that the median employee in the company does. All right, 278 times. In 1970, 1970, that number was 20, 20. And maybe 10 years before that, it was as little as eight or 12. Now, how did that happen? What happened is that in, typically in companies, people at all levels within the organization were asked or had as part of their responsibility some kind of uh, task that typically involves management, a, uh, a product design, a, a pricing, uh, you know, foreman on the line, whatever. So they shared in the management responsibility and they shared in the management rewards and they were more evenly distribute, distributed uh, within the company. And now the chief, you know, pretty much uh, and his, uh, you know, very uh, uh, senior officers, they, uh, they get a much, much larger percentage of the money. Sometimes consultants, they farm this out to consultants and they take over some of the managerial tasks. And, you know, more and more, the uh, median employee is involved in uh, repetitive tasks. And the only thing they can do is maybe get a little better as each year passes uh, at that task. But they're not going to get rewarded to the extent that uh, senior management and even consultants who aren't even employees do for exercising uh, roles that once were done by employees. So uh, the result of this is that gap has widened uh, within the company and um, the, uh, you know, that's it. So people, uh, you know, do get jobs uh, at uh, certain levels, uh, but they don't typically uh, open up, I think, the kind of opportunities they once did because you're not exercising a role and participating in the management uh, the way you once did. Uh, and so you have this income disparity. And 
the question is, how can ethics narrow that gap? And so we'll go back to our frame, which is uh, law or, or three pronged frame. Law, there isn't much to say. There are compliance functions without with, throughout the organization. But in, increasingly, it's not the, you know, it's not employees at a certain level that make a decision whether or not to go ahead with uh, a certain task uh, because it, it, uh, it is legal, uh, so to speak. <laughs> That's either done by higher level people or by pe consultants or by the law firm or whatever. So then you have the middle group and they are uh, what you would call uh, management uh, markets and economics. And they make decisions based on say, as we've often discussed, the greatest good for the greatest number. That's uh, Jeremy Bentham, Adam Smith, uh, who, you know, said basically, uh, if everybody do acts in their own interests, uh, they will, providing it's legal, they will end up uh, with an equilibrium of uh, success or failure uh, as a result of the negotiations that ensue from, uh, you know, their desire to do business with one another. Uh, but then along came in 1970 in the New York Times magazine section, which is typically devoted to more serious matters like uh, Britney Spears and various other <laughs> types of leading historical figures, an article about by Milton Friedman, well-known economist of the time, I think still uh, pretty well-known. Milton Friedman, who I think the title was The, the uh, Job of, of a Corporation is to Make Money for Its Shareholders. Now, the consequences of that over time have been that management has focused on those tasks to a significant degree uh, because the share price has been the ultimate objective, uh, not the improvement of products or services, not new products or services, not improvement of working conditions uh, or upgrading the skills of their employees other than through ordinary uh, performance of their jobs, get that share price up there and do it as fast as you can because increasingly, not only do they get bonuses for that, but they are shareholders too. And so the increase in the price of shares uh, is also added to their, their income. So now, uh, whereas in 1970, the ratio of the CEO to the mid-level employee in total compensation was 20 to 1, it's now 278 to 1. Wow. Now, that is, that is real uh, income uh, inequality. So... How do we, you know, how do we deal with this? And we're now from the standpoint of ethics. Well, we deal with it by, as uh, recently and sadly lamented because he died recently, uh, he was about, although he was about 90 or 93, Daniel Kahneman. We do, we make these kinds of decisions by thinking fast and thinking slow. So fast is your immediate instinctive thought as to how to react to this situation uh, based uh, on your experience, based on your impulse, based on your thinking through 
things that you already know or have experienced. And uh, this has been described, this approach, and or you think slow, which means you ruminate for whatever amount of time you think you need. You dip your toe in the water, you talk to other people, you do research, and so on. Uh, now, back in the day when I was in school uh, and so on, and I don't know how widely known this is outside the field of academe, uh, that was known as the lion and the fox. The lion knows one big thing. The fox knows many small things. Now, it's also sometimes described as the hedgehog and the fox. But the idea is that there were people who knew one great thing, and they just made that decision. Uh, or there were people who knew many smaller things, foxes, and that's how they made their decision. And the key to a ex successful community, a what you might call a virtuo virtuous community, a virtuous commonwealth, was the ability of lions or hedgehogs to engage foxes or uh, engage foxes in uh, a common pursuit of the best outcome. And uh, that's 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 how that's how it operated. And the original lion and fox comes from Machiavelli. Uh, then came Isaiah Berlin, the hedgehog and the fox. But the whole idea was that this would be a that there were two different kinds of decision makers and in a virtuous commonwealth with virtuous citizens they would pool their resources their judgment their knowledge and they would make the best possible decision and there would be a, a pretty fair sharing of course the people in charge would get more uh, but it wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be a uh, 10 huge gap between the top 10% and the rest, and an even bigger gap between the top 1% and the next 9%. And so that's a situation uh, we have today. There's been uh, a lot of commentary about those great disparities and this being the time of year of graduations and you know uh, college presidents addressing students and their parents about the purpose of this uh, school or whatever it is and the connection has not often been made or not not been made as often as it should be so I want to, you know, before we run out of time, got a, a few minutes left, ask a question regarding curriculum. Now, many high schools hyper-focus on getting students ready for college. It's all about college, college, college. But what about those students that not, aren't looking for that type of education and want to focus on the trades where a lot of the focus has gone away? But last time I checked, in our lifetime, there will be toilets. In our lifetime, there will be and someone will have to clean them. <laughs> it's all. It's not going to change. The... <laughs> electricians. Yes. That we're, we're going to need electricians, and those trades actually now pay very well. How do you How do you feel about that? How do you address that? You know that uh, you know, the trades have kind of gone away when it comes to uh, emphasis on curriculum in high schools. Well, I don't know that high schools were ever responsible for a whole lot of that. It was, you know, if you were going to be a plumber, you went to work for a plumbing company or a business. 
And, you know, you knew some of that stuff. You had maybe been working for them during the vacation, during the summer. Or maybe it was a place that your uncle or your father owned. And he, you know, always was a he. He taught you the ropes. But I, I don't know. When I was in high school, we did have something called shop. Yes. But <laughs> yes. We, we used tools. We made wallets. You know, we did things like that. We didn't fix anything. <laughs> but at least it, we, we back then, you were encouraged or exposed to it. There was auto shop when I went to school. Yeah. There was electric shop. There was, um, you know, others, the metal shop. There was another one. At least the opportunity was there. It doesn't seem that it's it's so much there anymore, and it's always hyper focused on the, uh, you know, on getting you ready for college. But you may not be opting to go to college, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe you're. Well, I'm, I might away. choose to quibble a little with you there. I might say it's focused on getting you into college. I don't know how much it's focused on getting you ready for college. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> fair enough. And I a hundred percent agree with that. We're, we're out of time. Uh, fascinating looking at this and especially now with graduation, just, you know, a, a day away, a few days away, depending high school is next week, two weeks, actually only a day away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, appreciate you being here and all your viewpoints and uh, looking forward next time we get together, Ronald. Me too. Thank thanks you. for thanks for calling. Bye bye. Okay. Coming right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's it's going to be okay.